much, Joe, for a very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you to the organisers uh, for inviting me and for the team making me feel so welcome and, and looking after me so well. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here. And I, I use that word privilege very wisely. I wouldn't be here without the NHS. Uh, from Cole Sandler at uh, NHS 24 on the 111 calls, right the way through to this Charles Lane. I, I wouldn't be everybody involved in our Scottish healthcare system. So I'm going to tell you about our little story that unfolded in 2020. Um, now we've all got our own COVID journey that we've followed, and I'm aware that there will be people in the room today who are probably also unwell with COVID, uh, who have probably had family members who have been unwell and may have had to confront the fact that some family and friends haven't survived due to COVID. And I speak here as the lucky one who's fortunate enough to make it through the journey. Uh, we know that worldwide 6.1 million people haven't been as fortunate as me. And continually, uh, my thoughts go to not only them, but their families. So I'm going to tell you about what unfolded in March 2020 and the journey that then carried on after that. Um, like a, sorry. So the, the project, the, the title of today's talk that I'm going to give you is Conquest, uh, is called Conquest of an Infectious, uh, 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 Vicious Infective Disease. I've forgotten my own slides now, that's really bad, isn't it? You'd think I would know what disease I'd suffered from. Uh, and this little virus that was uh, it set out to cause absolute mayhem across the world. And of course, this is the first time uh, everybody in this audience has been back together since then. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about the start of the journey with the initial symptoms that I suffered and take you through uh, the initial intensive care stage uh, and through the treatment I had in the ECMO unit in Aberdeen uh, through to the recovery phase and rehabilitation uh, and then getting back to work and my continuing recovery. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I know of the story. Uh, I don't know all the details uh, and uh, my wife knows quite a bit of it because she had to lift the phone every day uh, and hear how I was getting on. Uh, and there may be little bits of details that we haven't quite got right, but hey, that's what patients do. They don't always tell you the 100% truth. So my initial symptoms started in March 2020. We were all preparing for lockdown. I think Boris and his friends were preparing for some other activities, but let's not go into that today. Uh, we were well aware of all the uh, healthcare and government information coming out about uh, patients returning from Italy, those that had been to the Far East, uh, who should be put into uh, quarantine. Uh, but my symptoms didn't quite match those that were uh, coming out uh, day in, day out. Uh, I didn't have the cough. I had a loss of appetite. I was feeling progressively more unwell as the third week of March unfolded. But the key symptom I had was I felt absolutely frozen. I'd never felt this cold in my life before. No matter what uh, I did at work with the heater on full blast in my office uh, or, or at home with the fire on, I just couldn't seem to get warm. And, and day in, day out, I got progressively more unwell until the fateful day that I couldn't go to work, uh, which, as I suppose everybody in the audience is, we're all addicted to our work. Uh, and when somebody takes that away from you, it's a bit frustrating. So. Uh, Thursday the 23rd of March or thereabouts, uh, I was unable to go to work for the first time in my career uh, and I had to uh, phone in and say that I wasn't going to be in today. As that day unfolded, uh, I thought my asthma was uh, going absolutely haywire. I, I just couldn't breathe. Uh, my wife phoned uh, uh, 111, uh, spent about 45 minutes on the phone and the call handlers were uh, fantastic. Uh, they tried to help her uh, as much as she could to help me. Uh, I've got a brother who's a GP in Glasgow, and you probably pick up I've got a little bit of a Glasgow twang about me having been born here. Uh, and my brother was very helpful in terms of advising uh, to sit upright and try and breathe as deeply as possible, but it just didn't work. Uh, and in the end, an ambulance came and carted me off to Nine Mills Hospital, uh, a place that I uh, go into every week to do some of my clinical work. Uh, and then I turned from clinician uh, to patient in a matter of seconds. Uh, and I had to face the reality that at that point I was the deteriorating patient, which of course we're here to think about as well today. Uh, in the weeks running up to it, I had been involved in some of the work around the deteriorating patient and had to redeploy uh, some of my 150 staff into various roles. So I had a rough idea that this wasn't a journey that was going to be particularly smooth. 
uh, stayed overnight and uh, on returning home the next day, I uh, had a phone call from uh, one of the public health consultants in Dayside uh, to tell me that uh, I was positive, I had the plague, I had to isolate, uh, which there was no doubt I wasn't going out uh, clubbing that night. I was, uh, I, I was looking for uh, uh, some uh, recovery to happen. Uh, a couple of days later, I was back in Niles, but this time on uh, high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, again, my breathing was absolutely shocking, uh, but things all turned for the worst a day or so later. Uh, when I, I actually don't remember the third admission, uh, but my wife and family tell me that an advanced paramedic arrived at the house uh, rather sharply, even a wheel about the country, uh, and there was a conversation about whether to admit me straight uh, into intensive care or whether to admit me through the normal uh, COVID route. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. I was admitted uh, and I was put uh, into uh, a corner of a ward because I was COVID positive along with a number of other patients. Uh, but one of the, the, the memories that struck me was that uh, one of the consultants and professors in respiratory medicine at Tayside was by my bed quite a bit uh, that night. Uh, and I kind of remember the mobile chest x-ray uh, being taken uh, and the said individual waiting to see the results. And I thought that, that must be bad news because uh, we don't normally get consultants uh, sticking around the ward uh, during the night. Uh, so I knew that things weren't, uh, weren't going particularly well at that point. Uh, overnight, uh, things deteriorated quite rapidly. Uh, I remember one of the nurses saying that my O2 sats had dropped to 87%. Uh, and I'm only an orthodontist, but I knew that that was way below uh, where I probably want to be as a healthy individual. Uh, I was acutely breathless. I felt my body was just being shredded by COVID. Uh, every part of my body was just being destroyed. Uh, I had some really strange thoughts and I had to acknowledge the fact that I knew that unless things were going to change, I was going to die. Uh, I had an out of body experience, something which I'd heard people talk about uh, both in the media and uh, I've got a friend who's had an out of body experience. Uh, and I, I don't think I ever want to do this journey again with out of body experience, but I was able to, to visualize myself uh, lying lifeless on the hospital bed. Uh, and I knew that I was moving closer uh, to the paranormal world uh, and perhaps to being, uh, to living with the spirits rather than uh, having my feet on terra firma. Uh, I have a faint memory of the ward round the next morning and saying to the consultant and medical team uh, that I'm going to die. Can you please save my life? Uh, perhaps uh, they were the best words I've ever spoken in my life. Uh, we all know that we should ask for help. Uh, and that was my time uh, to ask for it uh, from the NHS. Uh, there wasn't much fuss. Um, I was transferred around to intensive care uh, and uh, two uh, consultants from ICU and full PPE. Uh, uh, there was no concern. I wasn't bothered about any of that sort of nonsense. Uh, I just wanted my life to be saved. Uh, so a line was put into my arm uh, and within a flash, uh, I was off into the little world. Um, on looking back on that point in the journey, I was a bit I'm a bit frustrated that I didn't have time uh, to say my goodbyes to my wife, my wife and family. They've kind of forgiven me from that because they knew that the doctors were actually looking after me very well. But the final selfish thought that I said to myself was, I, I must fight this. There's no way that I should succumb. And perhaps uh, that bit of uh, mental uh, acuity at that point uh, served me in good stead for what was going to happen from then on. Um, I was on a conventional ventilator, even though I had uh, asked to be put on CPAP, but it was no real uh, um, purpose in CPAP at that point. Uh, I was the deteriorated patient who was becoming uh, dangerously unwell. Um, the, the doctors were very good with my wife and family, and for the first week or so, uh, things were relatively stable and they were all uh, pleased that things seemed to be going in the right direction. Uh, but at the end of that week, everything went belly up uh, and I crashed into critical illness. Uh, I, I didn't really know what critical illness involved uh, uh, until this point, uh, looking back on this journey, and I'm sure many people in the audience, both in the room and virtually, uh, have much more experience about critical illness than I do. Uh, but uh, looking back on it, uh, I hadn't quite realised uh, what a cytokine storm was. Now, we need cytokines in our body to do all sorts of things, including orthodontics, that uh, is important to be in my clinical work every day. Uh, but my cytokines were going to kill me as well. Uh, and I didn't realise just how dangerous uh, cytokines can be when they're out of control. Uh, I went into multi-organ failure uh, and was at that point uh, only clinging to life uh, very barely. Um, the intensive care guys tell me that uh, they had a sort of regular daily conference 
uh, with uh, colleagues around the country. Uh, and I understand that there was a, a discussion with the team in Leicester and Aberdeen about uh, should I be one of the people who should be retrieved? Uh, and I'm glad to say that the guys in Aberdeen, uh, including Stephen Fryer, who's in the audience, I don't know virtually or in person, uh, I'm glad that you guys actually uh, uh, decided that I, at a 49-year-old uh, young lad, uh, would potentially be able to survive this treatment. Uh, and I'm well aware that uh, that night was one of the busiest nights for the Aberdeen team to retrieve patients uh, and choices had to be made. So I'm very grateful uh, that I was one of the people who was fortunately uh, retrieved. Um, I was uh, taken off to one of the operating theatres in uh, Nine Miles Hospital uh, and the ECMO team from Aberdeen came uh, to uh, Nine Miles and as a fairly significantly massive MDT team, I'm sure, it works in teeth that insert various lines uh, into my body. Uh, and I know this picture isn't quite the exact uh, ECMO um, flow of uh, blood that I had, but it gives the idea, uh, certainly to me and, and probably to one or two people in the audience. Um, I didn't know what ECMO treatment was, uh, and uh, it's only in uh, the last year or two that I've been able to read up about it uh, and discover uh, how important it actually is. Uh, and uh, I'm probably going to belittle the treatment completely, but from uh, my purpose, it was a heart-lung bypass machine. And the idea was that it would give my lungs a bit of time uh, to recover in the hope that I might be able to survive. Um, there were various uh, uh, lines put into my body, as I mentioned already. I'm going to show you a little picture uh, of those in a, in a minute or two. Uh, and one of the consultants in Dundee told me that uh, at that point, when the portable ECMO machine was turned on, uh, my blood oxygen sats returned to 92, and I turned from a rather blue colour to a slightly more purple colour. Uh, and they all sighed a bit of relief that perhaps survival uh, may be in sight. Um, I was transferred to Aberdeen. It's a 70 mile journey from Dundee. Uh, I don't remember anything about it, uh, probably just as well. It was probably quite a kind of hairy, scary journey for the retrieval team, uh, who, as I mentioned, had been quite busy that day. Uh, I was then admitted to the ECMO unit and then I was put on to a, a, a sort of plumbed in machine, I guess, uh, and I was deeply sedated throughout. Um, I've got the pleasure next week of going to the Aberdeen ECMO unit uh, and meeting the people uh, who were so involved in saving my life. And I, I really look forward to uh, that little treat uh, next week uh, because I have no memory of any of this treatment uh, and I don't know who any of the people were who actually uh, looked after me. Uh, and I hope I didn't say any naughty words at any point uh, while I was uh, having probably the longest uh, sleep in my life. Um, so this extra corporeal membrane oxygen treatment uh, was indeed going to save my life. And as you can tell from the guy standing here, uh, that he did uh, uh, make a good survival. Until this point, I'd been a regular blood donor. I had donated 46 uh, units of blood over my life. Uh, I'm now on the banned list uh, by blood transfusion. Uh, and although I've only ever donated in Scotland, I'm not allowed to give Scottish blood back to the Scottish people. Uh, and I hope that's something that we can sort out, because I would like to get back to being a blood donor and give some of the extra on top of the 46 back, uh, because at the moment I'm a net recipient. Uh, and we don't really know how many units of blood uh, I was given, uh, but somebody had mentioned to me that around 56 units of blood uh, were needed in that time to keep me alive. Uh, this is a picture my wife took on the near me call, uh, which she did every day. And the ECMO team uh, were uh, kind enough to give her the space uh, to sit and chat to me um, for hours at end. Now, my wife's used to me not speaking back. Uh, I, 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 I am the perfect Scottish husband, you see, uh, and I should win the Husband of the Year award for all of this. Um, but I guess it must have been quite harrowing for her to have to chat to uh, the non-responding husband uh, on a regular basis. Um, th this photograph that she took uh, was very uh, important to her throughout the journey because uh, it gave her hope uh, that I would potentially uh, actually make it through this journey. Um, the ECMO team were very good with my wife and family, uh, regular updates with all the positive views, but sadly, more often than not, it was uh, uh, negative views that she was receiving. Uh, my friends, my family, my work colleagues, my extended professional colleagues, uh, were absolutely fantastic at, at mounting uh, a campaign uh, to let me know that they were thinking of me. Um, a, a, a shed load of cards would arrive, uh, not only in Aberdeen, but also in Nine Mills. Uh, and there was a kind of a joke uh, when I was recovering in Nine Mills 
uh, that the postman bring me more mail than anybody else in the hospital. Uh, it became a bit of a, a flower shop at home. Uh, there were all sorts of other things. Uh, there were various letters from people my wife had never uh, met, but uh, were important in my own professional life. Uh, uh, my immediate colleagues at work penned a song, uh, and there was a wee recording studio in my office put together. Uh, a very good friend of mine recorded a daily podcast. Uh, he would tell me to get off my ass and get out of my lazy bed. Uh, he, he told me some other things as well, which uh, maybe are not broadcastable now. Uh, but that, that daily podcast, uh, I think, was probably quite important. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was a flower shop. Uh, and all sorts of various gifts from uh, my, my family, friends and professional colleagues uh, would arrive. Um, uh, uh, the picture on the top left is a song that was played at our wedding by uh, a good friend of ours. Uh, and he uh, managed to re-record it uh, so that it could be played to me every day uh, to help my subconscious come back to life, which I guess uh, has been a very important thing for me uh, looking back on the journey. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is the crest of arms of the British Orthodontic Society, uh, who are nothing uh, but uh, faultless in this journey. Uh, and they mounted a campaign uh, of all orthodontists in the world, would you believe? Uh, and we actually had uh, contact from all seven continents, including somebody on Antarctica, uh, and some Tibetan prayer flags being hung out, uh, and some uh, Red Indian chiefs in uh, the middle of uh, the USA uh, all praying for me and looking after my soul. Uh, and I think this is kind of like the extra man on the football pitch that helped me get through the journey. Um, as I've alluded to, uh, multi-organ failure uh, was one of the problems that uh, cropped up along the journey. Uh, and I guess uh, this could probably have killed me as well. Uh, COVID had indeed ripped through my whole body. Uh, and uh, not only that, but my organs uh, kind of gave up along the way. Uh, I was on kidney dialysis for quite a significant amount of time. Uh, and uh, when I eventually woke up in intensive care in Dundee, I wondered why there was a dialysis machine next to me. And because I couldn't speak, I had no idea uh, why it was there. And it kind of troubled me day in, day out. Uh, but I eventually discovered that I had been on dialysis. Uh, apparently, my liver was knackered, uh, and hopefully uh, not from alcohol or any other substances. Uh, I suffered some pulmonary embolisms, and uh, the friend I alluded to earlier on, who had an out-of-body experience, uh, he uh, and I now have a regular conversation about pulmonary embolisms, uh, and we recognise how important uh, it is to avoid them. Uh, so I'm now anticoagulated for the rest of uh, my life. Um, my lungs were pretty crap, and I uh, apparently had a pneumothorax on one or two occasions. Um, uh, the, the, somebody has told me that I had a chest strain in, but we can't, in amongst all the scars, find where we think the chest strain should have gone. It, it's, it's a bit like the game Operation, uh, trying to work out what bits went in and out of my body. Um, it, it's quite interesting when it's yourself. Um, and I suffered some sepsis on just so many occasions, uh, and as you'll see, uh, in the recovery journey, uh, uh, sepsis was a bit of a problem and had to be eradicated still. Um, Pseudomonas is, of course, a, a bug that uh, is, is kind of around us all the time. Uh, and I hadn't realised that it was going to cause me one or two troubles uh, as well. Uh, and apparently I was pretty unwell with pseudomonas-related sepsis on a number of occasions. Uh, and there's, 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 the, my wife has a, a memory of the phone ringing at one point and somebody saying there was a mark uh, on a brain CT scan uh, and they were a bit concerned as to whether there had been a brain hemorrhage. Uh, and I don't know how big or small that was or how significant it was, uh, but nevertheless, uh, she had to come to the terms with the fact that even if I did survive at this point, uh, what would the outcome uh, actually be? So it was that scenario that every time the phone rang, uh, she needed one of her adult children to have a pen and paper there, uh, write everything down, get on Google, find out what was going on, uh, and try and get uh, her head around things. Um, and on and around uh, day 34, uh, the, the phrase my brother, who's a middle brother, who's a solicitor, remembers, is that he was told the last roll of the dice would be another high dose course of uh, steroids. Uh, and I guess it was quite fortunate that uh, this time at the casino, uh, things actually worked. Uh, and this time the high dose of steroids uh, actually turned the corner and we started to make uh, some improvements. Um, and my body on day 39 apparently uh, made some spontaneous improvements. Uh, and on command from the nurses, which having worked with nurses for my career, I would never disobey a command. Uh, but uh, my, my eyes flickered and I was able to lift a finger. And again, I'm just hopeful that it was the correct finger that was lifted. Uh, uh, our youngest, my, my, my own son Cameron, was 21 while I was in the ECMO unit. Uh, and apparently 
uh, I had nodded at the suggestion that I might want to try and see him on a video call, uh, and I was duly hoisted into a chair. Uh, the ECMO team uh, ra rushed around me to make sure that there was a, a kind of a celebration uh, for his 21st, uh, and somehow down the near me call, <clears throat> not only did we have uh, a healthcare uh, appointments, but we managed to have a 21st birthday down near me, which is, is probably a, a sort of a one-off in that system. Uh, the good news continued, and in day 42, the ECMO treatment was uh, reduced and the sedation eventually stopped. Uh, and there was hope that we'd move from uh, just survival uh, through to some form of rehabilitation. And this is really the second part of the, the story today. Uh, the, the rehabilitation is actually as important as uh, the survival journey to me. And until this point, I had no real understanding of, of what all the uh, rehabilitation world uh, that exists in NHS, because it's not something that I would deal with in my professional life. Uh, I was taken uh, back to operating theatre and a tracheostomy placed and put onto a conventional ventilator uh, and then was relatively stable. Uh, I was finally returned to intensive care in Dundee and uh, the, the journey of rehab began. But this photo is taken a little bit later in the journey, not uh, straight in the ECMO unit in Aberdeen. Uh, but uh, I, I guess my wife and family were quite pleased to see that uh, there, there were a few less pipes and tubes and cables uh, and bits of equipment around me. Uh, and uh, they, they, I guess we're getting the, 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 the hope that things were going to improve from that point on. I, I know I looked a bit like a Middle East terrorist at this point, but I hope you'll forgive me for not having uh, uh, looked after myself particularly well. The wake up call was probably the worst wake up uh, in my life. Uh, I, I've never suffered, suffered from paranoia, uh, dreams uh, or delusions, uh, but I had a number of absolutely horrific uh, thoughts uh, and perceptions. Uh, I thought I was in the middle of the jungle most of the time and there was a python climbing out the ceiling to kill me. It would wrap its, itself around my chest and crush me to death. That was actually probably just the ventilator uh, inflating and deflating my lungs, but it meant so much more to me. George Floyd had been killed by the uh, Minnesota police uh, just as I was waking up, so the radio was playing constantly in intensive care, uh, and I would portray myself in my dreams as being George Floyd with the nurses trying to kill me. Now, how ridiculous is that? Uh, and on retrospect, I realised that they weren't trying to kill me, they were actually looking after me. These guys had saved my life. Uh, but to me, uh, the, the nurses were the villains in it all, and I had to eventually apologise to them. Uh, and the third one was that I uh, somehow had been involved in the Brinks Mac Heathrow robbery in 1983. I was only a kid at that point, but somehow I had been coerced into helping the robbers uh, with all of this cash. Uh, and it, it is true, I don't have any of this in my bank account, uh, sadly, if only. Uh, the, the nurses spent absolute hours with me. A lot of the nurses were on uh, deployment from other areas, uh, and they spent literally hours uh, just holding my hand and telling me that everything would be okay. I knew as I was uh, moving further along the recovery journey uh, later on that my uh, my head was in a pretty bad place. Uh, and I, I have been counselled that I may suffer from P PTSD, uh, touch wood to date, uh, no symptoms. Uh, I, a question I'm asked every day is, what do you remember? And I have no memory of the ECMO period. I suspect a lot of NHS Scotland wants to forget the last two years, uh, but I have absolutely no memory of, of being in ECMO or, or any of the, 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 the sort of treatments around it. Um, I guess I was filled full of all sorts of drugs to uh, keep me alive, and they probably had all sorts of undesirable uh, mental health effects. Uh, and day on day, uh, my initial rehab was that the ventilator would be turned down. I would have to work harder just to breathe. Uh, and it was a long struggle, but I knew that uh, somewhere along the line, uh, there would be an end in sight. I didn't quite know when that end would be. Um, but as the days unfolded, I got to uh, discover uh, my body again. I, get to, I got to find out what was actually happening to me. Um, I, I, my, I had what was called foot drop. I'd never heard of that before as somebody who works at the top end of the body. Uh, so I had to have these boots uh, uh, lifting my, my soles of my feet up, uh, and I had the stockings pumping uh, the blood around my body to stop me getting any more uh, DVTs and uh, perhaps even any uh, more pulmonary embolisms, uh, which I suppose are quite a good thing to have when you're kind of lying in bed uh, for months on end. Um, I was numb from the neck down. I couldn't feel a thing. Uh, my, my skin and my body uh, just could I couldn't feel anything, anybody touching me, uh, any, any care being given to me. I couldn't feel a thing. But every time I coughed, I felt like my lungs were going to explode. Uh, it's the most unpleasant feeling that I probably have ever had in my life. 
I had a nasogastric tube to keep me alive. I needed to be bed bath, I needed to be rolled every couple of hours. Uh, and the nurses tell me that they've never been uh, so nervous brushing a person's teeth in their life uh, as somebody like me. And apparently I would give them a score out of 10 with my fingers uh, on how well they did. Um, so every couple of hours, I didn't really get a proper night's sleep, which I'm a little bit frustrated about. And you know, in terms of the friends and family test, I would like a, a, I'd like to just report back to NHS Scotland that I didn't really get a good night's sleep, and, uh, but that's only a, only a jest. Uh, but sadly, on, on many occasions, I just wanted to give up the journey. Uh, and this is one of the messages I want to convey to everybody today, uh, that we do need to keep our patients going through these horrific journeys. Uh, and the mental health support I got was second to none. Uh, the NHS Scotland gets a real beating for it. But when I asked for the mental health support, it, it was there and it was, it was very needed and it was very helpful. And it got me through uh, what was a very difficult period when I just wanted to stop breathing uh, and put the pillow over my head. I discovered one day that the only way out of this, this journey was to get better and I needed to uh, really get into the recovery journey. So the speech and language therapist spent a lot of time with me. Uh, they uh, knew that I was locked in and locked out. We had a, a, a little, um, it, it's a alphabet sheet that I would tap out some simple words. We then moved on to a voicing tablet, a bit like a Stephen Hawking's job. Uh, and then eventually when the tracheostomy was deflated, finally, I, I said my first words. And I was a bit puzzled why the whole intensive care team came to watch, uh, but they were quite keen to hear that I could actually speak. Uh, the dietitians worked tireless with me. Uh, the nasogastric tube had been keeping me alive, but eventually it blocked on day 78. Uh, and even our magic tonic of iron brew wasn't able to unblock it. And that's not a joke. Uh, they told me that the only way forward was to eat 3,000 calories a day. Now, I haven't officially been told to stop that, uh, so I plan to continue. The physios and OTs, they were to become a very important part of the journey. Uh, they were to ensure that uh, I was going to regain the strength and the muscle loss that had happened to me. I had lost 26 kilos, which was probably a good thing. Uh, and it took until day 86 with daily OT and physio to get me on my feet to stand for two seconds. Uh, I wasn't able uh, to be doing any Olympics at this point in time. It was a long way to go. Uh, I was moved onto a respiratory ward at that point. Uh, and intensive care three closed. And it was a bit of a kind of celebration that uh, this, this guy who had been troubling NHS Tayside uh, and Grampian for so long uh, was finally getting out of intensive care. Uh, and so there had to be a kind of good news press release uh, that went out. And I'm, I'm not up for uh, being in the, in the media eye, but I had to sort of confront the fact uh, that everybody wanted to celebrate this good news story uh, with my family, my friends and myself. So it kind of went a wee bit crazy on the, on the socials. Uh, and in the conventional media. Uh, and then we really got to work with the rehabilitation. Uh, it was a, a very simple journey, but it involved a regular uh, diet of uh, gym work every day from then on. Um, finally, I could sort of communicate with my friends and family uh, on, on the socials because my fingers started to work at that point, which is quite helpful. I could start to sort of tap my keyboard on my phone. Uh, and this is a little video uh, that some of my friends at work put together for me. My colleagues were absolutely tireless in giving me uh, all the support that I needed, and uh, they were they were looking after my clinical work while I was doing not very much. So we would go to the gym three times a day. It gave me a little break uh, from the respiratory ward patients. Uh, some were a little bit disturbed, uh, some were a bit mental. Uh, others uh, needed the police to be called. Uh, uh, you know, I've, ne I've never seen a drugs deal happen in a hospital, but I, I've witnessed it now. Uh, uh, and the three sessions of uh, OT and physio were fantastic every day. It gave me a bit of respite from the, the guys that uh, I was sharing a ward with. Uh, and on day 96, we finally got to take some steps. Uh, and there was a long lead up to this, I can tell you, with a lot of uh, people involved looking after me. Uh, and the NHS heroes that I have, uh, uh, the greatest respect for are the OTs and the physios. They just, everything that was needed would be done for me. Uh, and I guess I was lucky in terms of the, the, the being a, a patient in hospital when things were relatively quiet. Uh, but they looked after everything 
uh, there was a, a very functional and goal-focused approach to everything uh, that I wanted to achieve in the short, medium and long term. Uh, and I noted that these guys actually were driving uh, a lot of the stuff that happened within uh, the, the, the team. Uh, so this is me finally taking my first steps with the help of the Stand Aid machine. And you can see that the whole team around me, uh, these guys, I think this is as much a celebration for them uh, as it was for me. Uh, I, I, asked if, I asked somebody if they could take a little video of it. And having taken my first steps, they said, oh, the camera didn't work. Uh, can we do it all again? So, you know, you, you think I've only taken 10 steps here, but I actually took 20. Uh, and I, po I posted this on Facebook, and one of, one of my friends of uh, 30 plus years uh, posted a comment, which I still remember to this very day. He said, one giant step for man, which I thought was very, very appropriate. And then progressively, we worked through uh, all the various uh, gym machines, uh, all the way through the, the rehab journey. Um, and gradually, uh, everything became more intensive day in, day out. And as I say, we eventually got onto a Zimmer frame and finally onto walking sticks to get out of the hospital. Uh, and in day 107, I finally was decoupled from all the cables, lines and tubes uh, when the auction therapy stopped. And uh, I was finally free and able to move and able to go to the toilet, uh, which was a bit of a celebration, I can tell you, uh, on my own. As I mentioned, there were uh, some other interesting uh, gentlemen that uh, shared the prison ward, uh, the ward with me uh, uh, as well. Now, I, I didn't really know what occupational therapy involved until uh, this bit of my journey, but these guys looked after everything for me. They knew that uh, as a dentist and orthodontist, my hands and my arms were really quite important to me. Uh, and they put together a very uh, uh, bespoke package of care for me. Uh, we played all sorts of uh, um, uh, small games and large games uh, and everything to get my hands and arms working as efficiently as possible. Uh, I joked with them one day that, you know, how about a golf club and can we go for a, a quick round? And the next day, uh, the putter and the golf ball appeared. Uh, and so the, there's absolutely no end to the ingenuity uh, within the rehab team. And I'm, I'm really amazed by that. Um, in order to get out of hospital, I had to pass the whole series of tests. Uh, my, my mother, who's 91, has been in geriatric care a number of times over the years. Uh, and she had told me about all these tests that she had to pass. And here I was as the 50 or 49 year old, actually, at that point, uh, uh, lad having to you know, pass the bedroom test, uh, having to do the bathroom supervised, uh, having to dress myself uh, in front of the team. Uh, you know, there's no dignity involved, is there? Uh, uh, we, we did the kitchen test properly. Uh, I made uh, uh, an Egon Roni uh, uh, lunch for my wife. Um, I had to get up and down the stairs and we had to get in and out of the car to get home safely, of course. Uh, occasionally, my wife would uh, happen to meet us in the hospital grounds. We're doing an, an outdoor physio session, uh, and our dog, Sherlock Bones, that is his real name, uh, uh, he, he came to join us on a number of occasions, uh, and he was to become uh, my rehab bunny, uh, buddy as time went on. Uh, a CT scan was taken before uh, I was discharged, um, and uh, I remember the consultant pulling up the, the scans on the screen, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the July 2020 scan uh, looking at it and saying, oh, that's the wrong patient, uh, which was quite chuffed at that because they obviously didn't realise that my lungs would have made such a good recovery. So I was quite pleased with that. Uh, and certainly they were in a better shape than they were in, in April 2020. Uh, the gym work continued and we progressed on to uh, the walking sticks, as, as I say, and, and my hand control improved. Uh, and as we got towards discharge, uh, BBC Scotland and STV uh, want to do a little story on COVID and the journey. Uh, and so the, the telecameras came into a nine miles hospital and it had to be like a performing monkey uh, uh, to be able to get the shots that the cameramen want, wanted to take and so on and so forth. Uh, and I was quite surprised that Nicola Sturgeon even retweeted the STV clip uh, uh, later that day. Um, so even had the, the first minister looking after me, so you don't get much better than that. Uh, and I had the rather bizarre situation of uh, watching myself on the telly uh, that night in the hospital ward uh, with the other guy saying, hey, that's you, pal, <laughs> which I, I found quite interesting. And I had a wee moment of reflection, as, as I did every day in hospital. Uh, and on day 128, it, it was time to go home. And I, I kind of tried to count up everybody that I think had looked after me, uh, over 200 people. So I knew I'd hoovered up a fair bit of resource. Uh, and, and I realised that uh, I didn't know a lot of the people who had looked after me in the ECMO unit in Aberdeen. Um, uh, the hospital put a little uh, media release out yet again, uh, and again, the, the world was quite interested in what had happened. Uh, we had time for one last wee photo uh, before we left the hospital, 
uh, and I treasure this photo because uh, these guys had actually got me uh, out of hospital uh, upright and okay, I'm now uptight, but that's another story altogether. Uh, and we've got a wee video of, of this. Uh, Some of these people are my colleagues, some of them are, are good friends of mine, and others are people who have been involved in the journey. Uh, and I was really very emotional that day, as I, as I am uh, today, uh, to realise just what people had done for me. But it was important for me uh, to make that journey uh, to walk out of the hospital. And I didn't want to be wheeled out. It was key for me that I would step out of Ninewell's hospital uh, as, as, as a, a recovering patient. It does stop eventually, don't worry. And when I walk into Nine Wells, I don't get this uh, round of applause these days. Uh, the rehab continued when I got home. Um, I, I still had to deal with uh, the nebulizer uh, and try and get rid of the pseudomonas uh, once and forever, which was still in there. Uh, every day I would sit with uh, my nebulizer in the kitchen and watch the little red squirrels out the, the kitchen window. Uh, and I found them uh, to be a great waste of time if anybody's was looking for anything to take their time up. Uh, and I realised that I had to get my body back in a bit better shape. So walking and cycling were to be an important part of the rehab. Um, and my best advice for people is to get an e-bike. Uh, and I've now cycled uh, nearly a thousand miles uh, with colleagues and friends uh, up some gentle slopes. Uh, my kidneys still weren't in good nick, so they needed a bit of attention. Uh, and I had to go to Reno quite regularly just to have things checked. Uh, one of the problems I've been plagued with is long COVID is, is chronic pain, and I'm still on gabapentin. Uh, and it, I have a reactive arthritis with uh, pain and stiffness in my joints. And I just have to live with that, and that's fair enough. Uh, ironically, when I went to see uh, uh, rheumatology, they told me to get image CFS me, but it would put me at a higher risk of contracting COVID again, which was not a very good idea. Uh, we put together a little kitchen gym so I could uh, do a workout at home every day. Uh, and I would go to the, uh, the gym in the local community hospital uh, for intensive uh, gym work. And we gradually stepped up. Uh, towards high intensity interval training, which I thought was only for athletes. But uh, th these guys, these rehab team, uh, they put me through it as well. Uh, we all had to return to work at 2020, uh, uh, during 2020. Uh, my colleagues were incredible at getting me back to work. Uh, uh, they they uh, looked after my every need. And although my clinical job uh, had changed by that point, uh, they helped me with a phased return. Uh, and that really helped me just with the actual physical demands of getting around the hospital. But more importantly, I walked back into the hospital that I worked in uh, and I met my colleagues and friends uh, in person again. Uh, and our own Scottish Dental magazine, which is our own uh, uh, publication in Scotland, they ran a nice little story on me. Uh, and one year on, in uh, April to June 2020, uh, it was important that on the anniversary of uh, falling sick, uh, I went up uh, one of the hills at Glen Shee with uh, a great deal of help from uh, my friends. Uh, even some of the rehab team joined us and some of my patients' uh, uh, family joined us as well. Uh, it was important that I looked northeast to Aberdeen, uh, where my life had ultimately been saved, and southeast to Dundee, uh, where my life had been rebuilt. Uh, and we had a little dram on the top uh, of the hill, and uh, then the rain came back on, so we got back down and got into the cars. Uh, I continued with all the rehab, uh, and I still kind of continue with that today, to be honest. Uh, and as you can see, my lungs have never quite made it back to normal. Uh, my lungs will only ever be 75% uh, again, but you know, I'm alive and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the second question that people ask us regularly is, has COVID changed me? Uh, and this is a picture of my wife and I uh, out having dinner in October 2020. Uh, and no, it hasn't really changed who we are. It's changed the priorities in life for lots of us. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing. It, it, it's made me not sweat, as they say, anymore. Uh, and I just tell it as it is. So that's the, the sort of end of our little journey. Uh, and um, if you want to read any more, we, we did put it all into a book, which I'm sure one or two people have, have seen around. Uh, and if you want all the gory details, uh, there's a bit more in there. So I know I've sort of run over time a wee bit, but uh, hopefully that uh, still allows any questions that anybody might have. I think on behalf of everybody in the room, we would like to say a huge thank you to Grant for such a, a frank, um, honest, humorous, um, story and the impact of that I'm sure will be resonating right through this room. Um, a real story of hope, of incredible support, family, friends, 
but your colleagues as well and and the incredible multidisciplinary teams both across NHS Tayside and um, NHS Grampian. As a nurse I'm delighted to hear that you knew your place even when you were on your deathbed and I'm absolutely delighted to hear that and you shamelessly plug away. Um, I'm sure there'll be many people that will be um, looking to go and get that book. I'm sure that we have many questions in the room. We're a little bit shorter time, but I'm going to check first of all, Joan Marie, is there any from our virtual audience? Team, and there was lots of likes for Lynn's comment. And Julia Russell has just said, absolutely, thanks so much for sharing. So no questions, but lovely comments and lots of likes for those comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Grant in the room? If you put your hand up, we'll get the mic to you. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Gregor from Edinburgh. I mean, there was so much that was positive in your talk, and uh, I think we're all trying to think about some of the good learning that we've had over the past couple of years that you've been really tough. You mentioned uh, the video calls near me. That's something we, and certainly in my ICU, we didn't really do before COVID. How important was that for your for your family, do you think? The, the picture that I put up, uh, my wife found that the most important mm -hmm. picture uh, while I was at my lowest ebb. Um, and I think the video call with my son on his 21st, uh, it's probably not the best way to celebrate a birthday, but it's as good as it can be, because let's face it, you couldn't have outsiders coming in uh, to meet the sickest patients or the staff. Uh, so, you know, I think near me, I, I use it in my clinical practice and I, and I hear people talking about it in terms of its positives and its negatives. That's the one place where it's the only connectivity to the family. Uh, and perhaps it maybe should be on 24-7 uh, so the family can dip in and dip out as, as needed. Thank you. Any other questions? John Marie. Hi, um, yes, a question has come in from the virtual audience and it's Una McFadgen is asking, was psychology involved at any stage? Very much so. I, I actually work with a clinical psychologist uh, in my sort of routine cl kind of clinical care. Uh, and, and so when my mental health was not at its best, mm -hmm. I, I asked if uh, my colleague could come and just have a chat with me, uh, which she duly did uh, and gave me uh, lots of positive support, but also pointed me in the right direction for various resources. So, uh, you know, top marks to the mental health team as well. One last question and then we'll... Hi, thank you very much. Absolutely amazing talk. Um, my question is about long COVID and how we as a group um, prioritise the services and the support for all the people that are affected with long COVID. What do you think? What, how should we move that way? That's a tricky one. That's like a politician's question, isn't it? Um, so I, 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 in, in my mind, long COVID for some patients is now becoming perma-COVID. Uh, mm. And I do think we need to allocate some resources because uh, I, I, we have a lot of people who get in contact with us knowing our story and our journey, uh, asking for a bit of peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, and I'm astonished by how debilitating it is for some people uh, and how difficult they find it to access the care that they need. And I, and I don't really know the answer to that question. But I think we just need to allocate a little slice of the NHS cake uh, for perma COVID, uh, and I don't really know how much that, you know, how much money that means and what that entails. But I think we need to we need to consider it at least. Thank you, and I'd just like to take the opportunity again to thank you for being able to come today and to share your story. It, it really um, has set the tone for what will be an important day for our work. So thank you so much.